This week on the CNET Tech Review, it's time for our 2011 Year in Review. Join us as we examine the highlights and low points we saw this year in the technology world. Are you still glad you bought an iPad 2 or an iPhone 4S? Wondering why you're still holding on to your Netflix subscription? We'll look back at a kooky camera that you don't have to focus, complain again about yet another Facebook redesign, and say a final goodbye to a beloved visionary. It's all coming up right now. Hi everyone, I'm Molly Wood and welcome to the CNET Tech Review Year in Review for 2011. Normally on this show we collect our hottest videos of the week and tell you what's good and what's bad in the world of tech, plus offer our own unique tech wisdom in the form of the bottom line. We'll kind of do that this time, but instead of a week's worth of product and news, we'll do a whole year of the most notable gadgets, good and bad, and the news stories that we saw this year. Now we have a lot to get through, so let's start things off with the good. The year started off hot with one of the most anticipated devices of the previous year. While every other tablet maker was struggling to play catch up, and we'll get to that later, Apple came out of the gate with the iPad 2 and crushed it. We're going to introduce today iPad 2, the second generation iPad. Our own Donald Bell called it predictable and awesome with its much thinner design, faster processor and front facing camera. Plus, of course, the little magnetic cover that rocked our collective tech world. For me, the reason I keep coming back to the iPad is the apps. There's really no beating the selection and the quality of the stuff you can download here. At launch, there are over 65,000 apps designed specifically for the large screen of the iPad. No one else has that, and it's a key part of what keeps the iPad fresh and fun. It's thinner, lighter, faster, there's more carriers, more colors, more cameras, and more apps than you'll ever need. If you're looking for the best all-around tablet, this is the one. Obviously, the iPad 2 wasn't the only huge Apple release of the year. Months of speculation about iPhone 5 brought us to the big reveal in October, and it was not the iPhone 5. Well, I'm really pleased to tell you today all about the brand new iPhone 4S. Man, listen to that half-hearted applause. The masses howled about the unchanged design, the lack of 4G and all of that, but despite that initial disappointment, and of course some pesky battery troubles out of the gate, iPhone 4S turned out to be pretty darn good. iOS 5 added much needed improvements, the camera is spectacular, and the voice assistant Siri became everybody's favorite punchline, Easter egg generator, and occasionally even assistant. Who's your daddy? You are. Can we get back to work now? In other phone stories, Microsoft got serious about its mobile platform in 2011 and unveiled the massive update Windows Phone Mango. It didn't have Siri, but Microsoft promised there were 500 improvements in there. We like the spiffy tiled interface, features like group contacts, threaded messaging, and unified inboxes, and there were some pretty impressive Bing search features. It's attractive, it's usable, and we expect Mango to be a contender in 2012 and beyond. There are still some snags here and there, and the platform may not be ready to conquer the smartphone world, but it is much closer than it was before. In other notable developments in 2011, Google got serious about social, very serious about social. As Larry Page took the reins as CEO, he tied the bonuses of just about every employee to social success and took aim at Facebook with a new social network called Google+. It took many of Facebook's favorite features and added granular privacy controls in the form of drag and drop circles. The key social concept of Google+, is the circle. You can create circles for the different parts of your life, your work, your family, your friends, your hobbies. And then, to keep you from getting overwhelmed by all your contact social updates, you can watch just what's happening in particular circles by using streams. So if you're in the mood to see what's going on with your family, you just check out your family stream. At this stage in the game, Google Plus is getting huge traffic, but Facebook is proving just as hard to kill as it ever was. Although, they did themselves a little damage. We'll get to that in the bad. Meanwhile, in other big trends of 2011, it was the year of the music services. Amazon, Spotify, and Google Music are all trying to win you onto their individual music clouds. 
Amazon started it off in March with a cloud drive and a cloud player that lets you upload all your tunes to Amazon server and then stream them from anywhere. Of course, by the time we uploaded all that music, and it took a while, Spotify arrived stateside with the ability to subscribe and then play any song anytime minus the uploading. And then, just as we got used to Spotify, Google came along with Google Music. Cloud storage locker, streaming, plus some staff recommendations. How adorably year 2000. It does have good sharing though, including one full song share with your Google Plus friends. It's an abundance of riches in the music world. In fact, I think at this point, I might be using some combination of all three of those. Exhausting. But if you were bored by yet another version of cloud storage and a digital music locker, along came some all new technology mid-year to get us excited about, of all things, cameras. I mean, look at this thing. Hey guys, Brian Song here with CNET TV and we have a first look at the Lytro camera. This is the first ever light field camera. Now you see this design, it's really unique. It's not a traditional camera because this camera does not do traditional things. The light field technology in the Lytro promises to capture all the information in an image. You don't need to focus and then you create a full 3D image that you can manipulate later. No matter what I take right now, after the fact, I'll be able to choose what I want to focus on. Um, awesome. I pre-ordered the blue one and it had better ship in February, like they say. And finally, here in the good, we went into the year talking tablets. No surprise, we're leaving the year talking tablets. iPad 2 may have kicked things off, but by year's end, all we could talk about were the Kindle Fire and, surprisingly, the HP touchpad. With the Fire announcement, Amazon put the tablet world on notice, announcing a $199 device that doesn't try to be an iPad. It tries to be an e-reader, a movie viewer, and a basic web surfing device, all tied to Amazon and all for 199 bucks. At that price, I think it's a slam dunk. You're getting more entertainment options than on Barnes & Noble's Nook tablet, more screen than Apple's $199 iPod Touch, and an ease of use you're really not gonna find at any price. Now, speaking of low-priced tablets, the HP Touchpad was just another iPad competitor when it launched early in the year. In fact, it felt more like an iPad 1 competitor than an iPad 2 competitor. But when HP killed off the touchpad just a few months after it went on the market and then started selling it for 99 bucks, it suddenly became the must-have tablet of the year. It rocketed to the number two best-selling tablet after the iPad. What a difference a $400 price cut makes. On Friday, after HP's announcement that it was going to discontinue its touchpad tablet, the company announced an inventory fire sale. Touchpads began liquidating at retailers around the country for just $99 for the 16 gigabyte version and $149 for the 32 gigabyte version. The nation's largest electronics retailer, Best Buy, reversed itself when it decided to join the sale rather than just return shipments back to HP. I've been trying to pick up one of those $99 touchpads for months now. I am still holding out hope. And I'm exhausted already, but we haven't even gotten to the juicy stuff in the bad yet. So before we do, let's take a quick break. We'll be back with more CNET Tech Review right after this. Welcome back to the CNET Tech Review, our weekly video digest of all things good and bad we've seen here at CNET TV. This week, we're taking a look back at the tech year that was 2011. We've seen a lot of great stuff so far, but it wasn't all good news this year, as you'll see in our look back at the bad. Let's be honest, 2011 was the year of the also-ran tablet. The Motorola Zoom kicked off the Android tablet fanfare in March, but its high price and buggy honeycomb installation kept it in the niche category. Tablet after tablet followed. Remember some of these names? Lenovo IdeaPad K1, the Vizio tablet, the Sony S tablet, that one's actually kind of cool, the Lenovo IdeaPad A1, the Toshiba Thrive 7-inch tablet, the Asus Iconia Tab A501 4G on AT&T, the Asus ePad Slider S101. <gasps> Only the Samsung Galaxy Tab line had any traction at all, but Samsung spent the whole year fighting patent infringement lawsuits from Apple. And of course, there was the ill-fated BlackBerry Playbook, which best to not even speak of it. The top of the playbook is a sour note for me. There's a headphone jack and a pair of stereo mics, that's fine, but the power button, if you can see it, is this little teeny tiny thing made for baby fingers. It's also the button you'll need to use for waking the screen out of sleep mode, so you'll have to contend with it every day. 
Frankly, I think the ASUS Transformer Prime could turn it all around, though. Go check out that review at CNETTV.com. Bad tech news dominated 2011 as a massive earthquake and tsunami brought devastation in Japan. It killed thousands, it brought the country to the brink of nuclear disaster, and the effects on global manufacturing are still being felt. Stateside, we said goodbye to the U.S. manned space shuttle mission with final voyages by Discovery and Atlantis. Then again, at the end of the year, scientists noticed a potentially Earth-like planet in the habitable zone, so maybe we'll be back in spacecraft sooner than expected. And crazy times at some big-name companies. HP abruptly killed off its WebOS division and announced plans to spin off the PC unit. Then the board canned the guy who came up with that crazy idea, after hiring that guy, and installed Meg Whitman in his place. At press time, Whitman was still trying to decide what to do with WebOS and presumably the rest of the company. Wow. It was a rough year for Netflix, too. First, the company announced in July that it would hike prices around 60% and try to push more users towards streaming-only plans. Users revolted and quit. Not surprisingly, the concept of a roughly 70% price hike for DVDs and streaming made people who are addicted to TV and movies lose their minds. The Netflix Facebook page is filled with angry messages from people who say they're canceling their service. I mean, I'm sorry, Netflix. That's just, you know I love you. I'm just not sure that I'm in love with you like I was, and I, gu I guess I just think maybe it's time to start seeing other people. Then Netflix said it would split into two companies, and the second one, Quickster, would handle DVDs while Netflix just did streaming. Users revolted and quit. The online streaming service will keep the Netflix name. If you're confused and annoyed from the changes, Netflix is well aware the company co-founder and CEO Reed Hastings is responding to thousands of angry comments on the Netflix blog after writing an apology and explanation about the decision, saying this is a move to help strengthen the selection of shows on the streaming service. Finally, Netflix announced that it was really, really sorry and would stay together after all, price hike and all. Users revolted and quit. Netflix said it would continue to operate one website for both services. CEO Reed Hastings said in a statement, consumers value the simplicity Netflix has always offered, and we respect that. There is a difference between moving quickly, which Netflix has done very well for years, and moving too fast, which is what we did in this case. Like I said, bad year for Netflix. Also, a pretty bad year for Sony, which was hacked over and over again all spring. The worst attack took down the PlayStation Network, exposed the user information for some 70 million people, and may have exposed credit card data as well. Security analysts say this breach is one of the top five in history. Identity theft is a serious concern, and you should pretty much not trust any email that you receive from anyone for, I don't know, like the rest of your life, especially after the whole Epsilon thing a couple of weeks ago. Oh, and no, as usual, there's really nothing you can do here except sue as part of a massive class action lawsuit, and then six years from now, you'll get a check for about $3. Sometimes the cloud kind of sucks. It took Sony some two weeks to restore partial service, about a month to get PSN fully up and running, and then it was hacked again in September. Plus, there were smaller hacks on Sony sites around the world for weeks. In fact, summer 2011 was the summer of the hacker. Anonymous was constantly in the news along with its splinter group, Lulsec, which actually took responsibility for the Sony hack. Lulsec also defaced the PBS website, hacked Nintendo, and even messed with Rupert Murdoch. The news of the world scandal has brought the hacker group Lulzsec out of retirement. News Corporation newspaper The Sun's homepage was attacked and directed visitors to a fake article claiming that CEO Rupert Murdoch was dead. Later, The Sun's website redirected to Lulzsec's Twitter feed. Taking a step even further, the hacker group then tweeted the name and phone number of a Sun online editor and two others associated with the company. Although the group was mostly vapor by the end of the year after increasing international heat and multiple arrests. Now, we would be remiss if we didn't take a poke at Mark Zuckerberg in our year-end wrap-up. Facebook's F8 conference brought us the big fancy new timeline and open graph, the seamless sharing that means that in the future, every time you listen to a song, read an article, comment on a post, watch a movie, pick your nose, it will get auto-posted to Facebook. Huh, 2012, year of Google+. 
And after a sea of bad news, October brought us news that will change the tech world forever. On October 4th, 2011, Steve Jobs died. Genius only comes around once, I don't know, a couple centuries, so like this. So, saying thanks and, you know, rest in peace. I don't really think that words can really describe like anything about Steve other than just greatness. It's just right to do, you know, to respect a guy who had given the world so much like in terms of technology and, you know, rejuvenated a company that was on the edge of disaster. I just feel incredibly sad. I think the world over has lost a really incredible man and a visionary and he will be he will be deeply missed he's just one of the best minds of our generation i mean that's there's no other way to say it. i mean he's so affected our generation so and the those younger than me much you know so deeply because it's just changed the way they've all communicated with each other so i can't there's really there isn't really words to express how how much he's changed society it's incredible The bottom line for 2012, RIP Steve Jobs. What's next for Apple? Is it an opportunity for some other company? Or will Steve's legacy carry Apple's dominance into the next year and beyond? It's hard to say, but as the Steve Jobs biography started popping up in everyone's hands at the end of 2011, it was pretty clear the tech world just wouldn't be quite the same. So there you have it. We've reached the end of the show and the end of another year, but come back next week for an all new CNET Tech Review. Until then, there are tons of great videos available every day at CNETTV.com. I'll see you next time, and thank you for watching.